your aggressive feelings, boy. Let the heat flow through you. We have a massive amount of Stellaris news to cover today. First and foremost in these news items is that there is a 3.9 open beta that is live right now so you can go and test all of the changes coming if you want to. More on that later in the video. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at the changes coming to the Humanoids DLC, including a brand new tradition tree, a bunch of new traits, some new port traits, we're also going to be getting a new Ascension perk coming for Machine Empires if you have the Necroids DLC. Trade is getting something of a rework and a rebalance. Some jobs and some numbers are shifting around in quite a large way that could spell some disastrous things for your merchant-based empire. We're also getting a brand new socialist megacorp civic that looks really rather interesting. Some changes to automation that should help with some of the issues that people have been facing. And finally, we're going to take a look through the changes coming to habitats, which should be arriving now with patch 3.9. Without any further ado though, let's dive in. First up, we have the changes and new features the devs are going to be adding to the humanoid species pack. The pack received some nice improvements all the way back in patch 3.1 LEM, but it still lacked something. So the devs have returned once again to give it another pass. For the humanoid species pack, they wanted to make something new. Species packs have had traits, ascension perks, civics, and origins. And now they are introducing the first ever species pack tradition tree. This is the enmity tradition tree. The Enmity Tree is not restricted to the Humanoids Species class as well. That is something we do have to bear in mind so anyone can take this. You just have to have the Humanoid Species Pack DLC. The Enmity Tradition Tree is all about rivals and making the most of having them. The Adoption and Finisher bonus allows you to rival even more people than normal to extract as many bonuses as you can. The opening effects for adopting the Enmity Tradition grant you an extra 3% pop growth per neighboring rival and 3% pop assembly speed. This is probably most useful early on for hive mind empires. You'll also get the powerful second strike agenda which we'll take a look at in a moment. The finisher effect will grant you as usual an ascension perk an available envoy is also included and you will unlock the antagonistic diplomatic stance. This tradition in essence when you adopt it and finish it allows you to rival even more people than normal to extract as many bonuses as you possibly can. Parts of this tree will reward you for maintaining loads of rivals such as rise to the occasion. In the face of the ever increasing number of adversaries we stand united gain plus 0.5 leader capacity per rival. Good news, we found a xenophobe, now we can afford to employ another scientist. Whilst the right hand side of the tree will be helping you compete against your rivals, match here is all about establishing an equal playing field. While militarily weaker than a rival, you will get minus 10% ship build cost and 10% ship build speed. While scientifically weaker than a rival, you will get minus 15% researcher upkeep and minus 100% research labs build speed. I don't think the reduction in lab build speed reduces you down to a zero day build. I think it halves it uh, rather than going down to complete zero so you won't be instant building, but I could be wrong. Finally, while economically weaker than a rival, all of your workers will get plus 10% output. This means that rivaling stronger empires is sometimes a very, very good idea. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, when you grab this tradition tree, you also get access to a powerful agenda if you own galactic paragons. Since this agenda is more of a tactical one, it will finish twice as fast as other tradition based agendas, which is really quite interesting. The initial modifier is plus 10% sublight speed and minus 10% time spent missing in action. The launched modifier gives you plus 25% sublight speed and plus one disengagement opportunities. And the final launch effect is that you remove all truces with your rivals. Yes, the devs have now included a way to get around truce cooldowns 
as long as you're trying to rival that a player. This could have some very, very profound effects on PvP in Stellaris, and I am very excited to see what players are going to do with it. Because no longer will you be safe if you peace out from a war and surrender straight away. You will no longer get that guaranteed 10 years of peace. From now on, another empire could go for a second strike in order to wipe you out. And now we get to see what the new diplomatic stance antagonistic is going to do for us. Your empire wants to compete against all possible rivals. This stance will increase the negative opinion impact of being rivals by 100, making you hate each other even more. Restrictions on the rival action against empires more powerful than us are removed. Restrictions on the rival action are relaxed both for and against us. We will also get two more maximum rivalries, plus 20 unity from rivalries, plus 100% border friction, and plus 5% diplomatic weight per rival. This means early on, if we can find some other empires and finish this tradition in the first 10 to 20 years, we could be looking at getting a whopping 100 to 120 additional unity simply from our rivalries. You get a rivalry, and you get a rivalry. Rivalries for everybody. Now this is going to give you some very dumb ways to die. For example, here you can see that we can declare rivalry against a fallen empire. That, that really is a dumb way to die, but it could give us some short-term bonuses, which would be nice. I wonder if we can stack those match bonuses or if they only fire once. If we could stack them, maybe we could declare rivalry with a lot of fallen empires in our galaxy early on to get those massive reductions in shipbuild cost, worker output, and researcher upkeep stacked over and over. Well, I suspect it is only one time. Overall, I think this new tradition will add a lot for the warmongering players out there who want some catch-up mechanisms between their empire and slightly more powerful neighboring empires through the use of rivalry. And if you're enjoying this video, please rival that like button. Another thing the developers haven't done for a while is add more negative traits. The humanoid species pack will now give you two as well as a fun new positive one on top of that. First up, we have psychological infertility. This can be taken with a lot of the positive pot growth traits in the game, as well as one of the other traits, which we'll get to in just a moment. Whenever you are at war or you are fighting the crisis, you will get minus 30% pot growth on your species. Members of this species are extremely sensitive to the rigors of conflict with the resulting stress taking over the more primal urges. And then there is existential iteropadity. This species grew up in hostile conditions where outbreeding your rivals was the key to survival. This will cost two points and it is a positive trait, the complete opposite of what we just saw with psychological infertility. During war and crisis, your species gains 30% additional pop growth. This might actually be quite powerful if you can use it correctly and lock yourself in some permanent states of war with empires that actually cannot prosecute the war. That means you'll be getting all of this extra pop growth and you won't really have to do much for it. The other negative trait we're getting is a minus one, and this is for players that really want to try their luck or just bully the servile species, and it's called Jinxed. Leaders from this species seem clumsier and more prone to accidents or vices than average, as if cursed from birth. Leader maximum negative traits plus one. There's also an interesting little comment from the devs under this one. The Zin saw a black cat across the street but didn't understand the significance. Reinforcements have also arrived. The devs have two new portraits coming to the humanoid species pack. Unlike lithoids and plantoids, where they wanted to add more human-like variants of the phenotypes, the humanoids pack was already full of, well, humanoids. So they decided to make two more to add more variety to the available portraits. Dimorphism, that is the difference between the genders in this species, is mainly all about the skin markings and the hair. 
I must say, originally I didn't notice that this was hair on the right hand side individual here. I thought it was some sort of brown fleshy growth and it kind of reminded me of one of the species from Star Trek Voyager. However, now that I know it's hair, it actually seems quite a unique and individual species look kind of reminding me of plants in some way, but I guess that's mainly because of the way the hair is braided on the left and individual. Whatever you think, I'm definitely glad to be getting extra phenotypes, extra portraits into our species packs. It's going to add more replayability and more variety in future games, and that's definitely a plus. The second set of portraits is a different take on the whole badass space elves kind of genre. You can see here we've got a whole bunch of different outfits on the scientists, different color variants, and of course we also have a female variant too. The large raised eyebrows, the, the bones around the eyebrow, I think kind of take away from the space elf theme in some ways, though they do look almost tree-like with the markings, the ridges, etc. It's very much kind of a tree style of growth. Um, I'm not sure I love them, but it is again definitely cool to get extra portraits. Then we've got some changes coming to the Necroid Species Pack as well. The Necroid Species Pack has already received a large number of improvements over time. Reanimated armies in particular changed from being a very niche civic into a much more interesting one as reanimators, and then was expanded to include megacorps and hives with permanent employment and cordyceptic drones. The only ones left out of the fun were the machines, but no longer. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the Metromancy Ascension perk. Biologicals are merely a different kind of machine. We can stimulate the appropriate synapses and reanimate these creatures for our own benefit. What are the effects? Well, we'll get plus 15% large slot weapon damage, plus 15% X slot weapon damage, and plus 15% Titan slot weapon damage. On top of that, defeated organic leviathans can sometimes be resurrected. Purged biologicals or lithoid pops may be restored as cyborg zombies. Those effects together are really, really interesting, especially if as a determined exterminator, you can go out purging the biologicals and then bring them back as cyborgs. Mechromancy has no prerequisites, so can be taken as Machine Intelligence's very first ascension perk. Basically, have you tried turning the squishy meat bag off and on again? They can, of course, reanimate certain leviathans, that sort of thing, and when you do, you'll get an event pop up like this one. The successful installation of Mechromancy protocols will enable us to reanimate certain deceased leviathans. Organic components are inferior to mechanical upgrades. We can engineer the flesh and produce a facsimile of organic life. This will bring a massive, massive change to the Here Be Dragon origin for certain machine empires, because now they will also be able to kill and resurrect their own dragon at the start of the game. And as it doesn't take a civic slot, this is of course an ascension perk, that is going to be quite a powerful early choice that you will have at your disposal. The devs are also doing something of a rebalance for trading jobs and trade in the game. What is going to be changing? Well, one unintended consequence of the sources of trade value throughout the game was that trade focused empires ended up having more merchants than the developers intended. To curtail this and reduce the number of ruler strata jobs in the empires, the devs have introduced two new jobs to the game. I'm going to take a moment briefly and outline for those of you that are a bit unsure why it is somewhat unbalanced to have all of these ruler level jobs running around. Because of the way that political weight is calculated, certain uh, species rights packages, certain living standards grant massive additional political weight to ruler class pops. And if your empire is comprised of mainly ruler class pops, that means you have an artificially high political weight. And because of the way unity generation works for our factions, i.e. the total unity output is equal to a summation of that political weight multiplied by the number of pops with their weight, you can get artificially high unity production. 
We first of all have the Trader. This is a new specialist type trade value job. These proud deal makers boost the value of everyday commodities and expedite the movement of goods to where they are most needed or desired. Traders, willing to buy and sell anything on the galactic market. This will grant plus eight trade value plus two amenities and have an upkeep of two consumer goods. Traders will replace merchants from most sources and are also granted in place of clerks for some buildings. The amenities are only produced if you have the commercial enterprise tradition, however. We'll get to that in a moment. First off, this is quite a bit lower in terms of base trade value output than a merchant. A merchant starts at 12 and has more amenities. A trader starts at eight. I'm also interested to see if they have buffed things like the uh, merchant guilds to grant more trade value to traders and not just clerks, because you can get a clerk's base trade value output up to eight relatively easily by stacking modifiers. Here we have the new commercial enterprise tradition pick. No halfway good business opportunity escapes the notice of our entrepreneurs. Remember, they're only entrepreneurs if they're from the entrepreneurial region of France, otherwise they're just sparkling businessmen. Traders will produce plus two amenities, commercial zones, commercial segments, trade districts, or provide additional trader jobs. Nuministic priests is the other new trade-based job we are going to be getting. These replace the merchant and priest jobs provided by nuministic shrines. These specialist strata jobs have an upkeep of two consumer goods like traders and produce six trade value, two unity and two amenities. However, for the purposes of any bonuses provided to jobs, they count as both traders and priests. Given that these produce unity and trade value, this means that taking the consumer goods trade policy is probably more powerful if you have an empire filled with these priests than going for the unity, unless you really want to double down on the unity output, the unity trade uh, policy. But of course, the best as ever is going to be that federation trade policy granting you energy credits, unity and consumer goods. The humble and some might say dastardly clerk job has been rebalanced and now produces three trade value and three amenities instead of the previous four trade value and two amenities. Taking triple up economics tradition increases their output to four trade value and four amenities, but no longer grants additional clerk jobs. This kind of means clerks are more of an amenity producing uh, job now, an amenity production role than a base uh, economic output role for trade value empires. We haven't seen the full interactions that are possible with these new jobs and these new roles, so we cannot know the full impact. However, I speculate that this overall represents something of a nerf to trade value based empires. Alongside these trade based changes, we're also getting a new civic for corporate empires. A player fantasy that has occasionally been requested from the community is the idea of a worker led corporate empire. After playing around with this concept quite a bit, the devs asked themselves, should it be a new authority, an origin, a civic? They decided to make a worker cooperative civic without sharing too many of the features of shared burdens, no pun intended. Members of this society enjoy an equal share in the labors, profits and aspirations of the cooperative's ventures. This civic will allow the employee ownership living standard under which all pops have high consumer goods upkeep regardless of the strata. This disables the use of most other living standards as well. It allows the mutual aid trade policy to be enacted, which converts trade value into energy credits, minerals and food. So you will get all of your basic resources from trade value. You will replace the executive and manager jobs in your empire with steward jobs. Stewards turn consumer goods into unity, trade value and amenities. Stewards are basically a specialist role as well. So that means for a lot of the game, especially early on, you will have absolutely no ruler strata pops as they will be entirely replaced with these stewards. 
you get some modifiers empire wide that is minus 66 percent pop demotion time which isn't really that amazing but it's kind of nice and plus 50 percent egalitarian ethics attraction which could be very good for your production of unity from factions you also get a unique council position that is a uh, general secretary of unions yes you can get a general secretary. This definitely isn't communism. This is a worker cooperative, which is totally different, didn't you know? Stewards will produce an additional plus 0.25 trade value and 0.25 amenities per level of this counselor. You must be some form of egalitarian and there is a bunch of other civics you cannot take. As you can see from this screen, which is the opening planetary management screen for a worker cooperative empire, there are absolutely no rulers to be found anywhere. I don't know what happened to them, I'm sure they're doing absolutely fine, they're just not alive on this planet anymore. Here is the living standard employee ownership. You'll see that all of the pops require half a consumer good, which is half as many consumer goods as utopian abundance, and they all get plus 300% political power. However, instead of getting increased happiness and faster pop demotion time, this living standard gives pops the same trade value production as utopian abundance and then it is further improved by a tradition swap for the civic. That tradition swap is adaptive shareholder schemes. By adopting a more flexible approach to our shareholder contracts, our citizens can be inspired to work more effectively. So basically they're kind of re-implementing capitalism a bit, I assume. Um, Pops with the employee ownership living standard get plus 5% happiness and plus 5% resources from jobs. That is quite a powerful little boost for a single tradition pick. Meanwhile, the mutual aid trade policy allows your empire to reinvest their profits back into the upkeep of your pops. This in theory allows for some fairly powerful early game expansion if you're running a trade focused build. For each one trade value, you'll be getting 0.3 energy, 0.2 minerals and 0.2 food. I hope there's some way of getting rid of that food rather than just selling it back for more energy, but overall I think this is going to be a relatively interesting and possibly powerful early game choice, though later on I do think it may uh, scale off somewhat. Apparently, the game director Eladrin, when given this uh, civic to play with, immediately twisted it into a void dweller relentless industrialist dystopia, screaming that the invisible hand of the free market will handle the externalities. So your utopia mileage may vary. The devs are going to be making some minor tweaks to automation. More improvements are being made to planetary automation. Based on feedback that they received primarily from newer players, they've removed dedicated automation stockpiles from the game entirely. Planetary automation will simply use resources from your empire stockpiles, removing one unintuitive step from the process as well as getting rid of some weird and unintended resource conversion quirks. The automation setting panel now lets you restrict certain resources from use by the automation system. So you can do things like forbid the use of rare crystals if you have important plans for those. This does mean that we can no longer build our buildings out of only energy credits. So this is a straight up nerf to any players that were abusing the uh, weird quirks of trading in the automation system and going for an energy based economy in order to build all their buildings thus not requiring minerals or strategic resources for any upgrades or any crazy stuff like that. Personally I'm very much in favour of this change. I, I don't see any issues with this actually. It, it streamlines the automation process, you don't have that silly stockpile and it removes the, uh, the, the game breaking silly effects that we've seen in the past that have actually become quite important, especially in a PvP setting, and it did generally feel wrong. Now we have a rather large section on habitats and the changes coming. For those of you that have been following the habitat experiment with great interest since Dev Diary 306, you'll be happy to know it has continued and it's looking positive towards its inclusion in 3.9 Kalem by the time the update releases. Following on from the game director's directive to simplify the habitat prototypes and the feedback that they've received, Alfrey has continued iterating on the planned rework for habitats. 
So what's changed from 3.8? Well, habitats as a megastructure and colony slash planet are limited to one per system. That is only a single colony or planet that you will get with the planetary management interface. And that will come in the form of a habitat central complex megastructure, which when built spawns a colonizable habitat and a major orbital. Once this has been constructed, additional major orbitals can be constructed around planets in the system and minor orbitals can be constructed around asteroids and moons in the system. When constructed, a habitat central complex will start at size 6 and habitation and industrial districts will be entirely uncapped. Research, energy and mining districts are however limited to three multiplied by the number of deposits in the system that have an orbital. Habitation districts have also been changed to now provide six housing, two clerk or maintenance drone jobs and half a building slot. If an orbital is constructed around a planet, moon or asteroid with exotic gas, rare crystals or volatile moats deposit, the deposit will automatically provide the jobs to collect the resources without needing to construct a resource extraction building, as long as you have researched the relevant technology. While orbitals constructed around alloy, zero, dark matter or other such deposits will automatically provide the resources just as habitats currently do. So a lot of this is very similar to the information we saw recently on the proposed habitat changes. As orbitals are treated much like mining or research stations in the system, they can be attacked by hostile forces but will be disabled when they hit 5% hull points instead of being destroyed. However, crisis factions will of course outright destroy the orbitals, similar to now if they attack your habitats. When an orbital is destroyed, the habitat central complex will gain 10% devastation and a blocker depending on the type of orbital. For example, here we can see the ruined minor orbital getting minus 5% species habitability cap whilst it is in place. Whereas if you lose a major orbital, not only will you get that minus 5% species habitability cap, but also a nasty minus one maximum districts. Habitat complexes will be upgradable through the planetary decisions, much like it has been in the past, except instead of increasing the planet's size, these upgrades will now increase the habitability, which is going to be very useful since habitats start at a measly 40% habitability. And it will also boost the district and building slots provided by your orbitals. Here we're currently seeing the technologies on offer, and here we have what those decisions will actually do. So expanding your habitat grants 10% habitability, an extra 0.25 max district slots from major orbitals and 0.25 building slots from housing orbitals. And if you go all the way up to advanced habitat complex, you get a further 10% habitability, putting you, I believe at a minimum of 60% and then getting another 0.25 max district slots from major orbitals and 0.25 building slots from housing orbitals. Overall, this means all of our major orbitals when we fully upgrade will each provide one maximum district slot and all of our housing orbitals will each provide one building slot. The effects and modifiers for both the Void Dweller Origin and the Voidborn Ascension perk have been reworked to take these changes into account allowing for Void Dwellers to inherit most of the effects of the Voidborn Ascension perk. I believe that means that you can't or at least don't want to take the Voidborn Ascension perk now if you are a Void Dweller. The main changes coming to this origin are that now, instead of getting guaranteed habitable worlds, you will get resource-rich systems instead of colonizable planets. That's a massive change. We, as Void Dwellers, never got colonizable planets. We actually got nothing. Now we will be getting something and you can construct advanced housing buildings on habitats. You'll get minus 25% to your habitat build cost. I believe that's for also the orbitals as well. You will get an additional uh, 0.25 building slots from non-urban habitat districts and plus one jobs from habitat districts overall, basically making your habitats just that little bit better than anyone else's. Jumping over to look at the Voidborn Ascension perk, you'll see most of the bonuses are very similar. 
you'll get minus 20% habitat build cost instead of the Voidborn minus 25, and then the bonus for building slots from non-urban habitat districts is the same, as is the bonus to jobs from habitat districts. Putting all of these changes together means that the starting uh, habitat complex, if you're a void dweller, will look something like this. You're going to be getting 28 pops like most regular starts in the game, a whole bunch of uh, some districts down there with the ability to not only build more districts but also space in your system to build more major orbitals and minor orbitals granting you further bonuses and further opportunities. And here we have the same habitat after constructing all available orbitals and fully upgrading it. You can see there are a massive number of possible districts we can put down, plus a bunch of open building slots. As we build more habitation districts, we can get more building slots just like city districts on a regular world. While updating the Void Dweller starting conditions, the developers ran into an old bug. Void Dwellers with the Sol system would spawn the guaranteed habitable worlds if that setting was enabled, though the planets would be of a random planet class. But those with the Trinary Void Dweller system would not spawn these systems. To fix this, they've updated both starting systems for Void Dwellers so that the first world is replaced with a frozen planet with a research deposit and a large number of research deposits scattered throughout the system, while the second world is replaced with a molten world with an alloy deposit and a large number of mineral and energy deposits scattered throughout the system. This does mean that with the guaranteed habitable world setting, Void Dwellers are instead guaranteed a number of resource-rich systems designed for setting up habitat complexes. And the last piece of news, which is by absolutely no means the least, is that patch 3.9 is available right now to try in open beta. If you go to Steam, if you go to Stellaris Properties, the betas tab, and then select Stellaris underscore test 3.9 open beta branch, you can try out some of these changes right now. There is a full open beta preliminary change log, which we don't actually have time to cover in this video because this video and Dev Diary have been an absolute monster, but I will go through the full change log very, very soon. If you'd like to see that, let me know down in the comments below. If you'd like to know more about the changes coming with patch 3.9, specifically the Plantoids changes and new Enclave leaders which come with unique traits and their very own unique council position, click the video on screen now.